So it's a, it's a privilege to be here. It's a privilege to share uh, the stage with, uh, with Alex. Um, I, I just want to begin by saying this is actually a historic occasion, although most of you don't know this, and you, you certainly don't know this. Um, Alex obviously is like one of the most badass climbers in the world, and, and I'm a hypochondriac. Um, so on stage, for the one and only time, the world's most fearless man and the world's most fearful man. Uh, so it's, it's a good pairing, I hope. Um, so I just want to very quickly get a sense of the audience, just so that we know who we're, who we're, who we're talking to. Um, raise your hands if you've seen Free Solo or read uh, Alone on the Wall. Okay, so you're, you're, you're in a room full of, of, of fans. Raise your hands if you are rock climbers. Okay, raise your hands if you have Free Soloed. One, two, okay, awesome. Now, but, but raise your hand if you ski, because that's way more dangerous. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just saying. <laughs> so, um, this is what I was gonna ask. Uh, raise your hands if you consider yourself in some aspect of your life, no matter what you do, you consider yourself a risk taker. Okay. It's because they all ski. Oh yeah. <laughs> they just don't know they're risk takers, right? All right, so, so what I wanted to do was really sort of think about, you know, questions of risk, questions about your, your process and, uh, and preparation. And when I was reading Alone on the Wall, you were describing your, your climb of uh, Moonlight Buttress, your first, uh, I guess it was 2008, your first, uh, your first free solo, which you did by yourself kind of not telling anyone, right? Yeah, the most solos have been by myself, except for the notable exception of, of making a movie about free soloing. But for the most part, free soloing is, is totally by yourself. But you just didn't tell, you didn't tell a soul you were gonna do it? No, the, the whole, my whole experience on Moonlight Budgets, Moonlight was one of the first big free solos that I did, and it was sort of at the beginning of becoming a professional climber and getting you know, sponsored by companies and things like that. But, um, but the whole process took me less than a week. I mean, I basically showed up in Zion National Park, spent a couple days working the route, then it rained a little bit, so I had to rest, and then I did the climb. And so it's pretty, you know, it's a pretty contained experience. So one of the things you and, wrote... It, what, and, and, and to be fair, I mean, it's pre-smartphone. I didn't have that many friends. You know, there's nobody really to tell about it. You know what I mean? Like, there's no... You know what I mean? I was living in a car by myself, and I just... And you, don't, you don't have great cell service, and you don't have any friends. It's like, it's just... But, like, um, do you have, like, dog tags in case you fall, and just people can... No, no, I figure people will find my flip phone and figure it out. <laughs> no, it's just, uh... Yeah, just, I don't know. Yeah, I didn't really think about it. So one of the things you write about the climb is, I was very struck by this. Um, you write, I was 100% certain I would not fall off, and that certainty is what kept me from falling off. Can you just talk about that sense of certainty that you need to, to climb like that? Yeah, I mean, I think that that, that sentence kind of gets to the heart of free soloing in some ways, which is that at, at the base of it, there has to be a self-confidence. There, there has to be a real confidence that you can do the thing that you're setting out to do. And I think that you know, the only way that it really works out is if you can maintain that confidence throughout. I mean, you know, basically, if you get scared while free soloing, it all starts to crumble a little bit. You start to not trust your feet. You don't weight them as well. They're much more likely to slip. I mean, basically, everything can kind of spiral negatively. Uh, whereas if you can, you know, if you're 100% confident you can do the thing and then you go up and you climb at your best, then, you know, then you do actually do it, I guess. So, I mean, but apropos... Though, though actually, though, that still needs to be based upon the, I mean, you do actually have to be able to do the climb. Um, and that's why I had, and, and that's why I had practiced ahead of time. The thing is, basically, I had done it on a rope many times. Uh, you know, over the preceding couple days, I'd, I'd gone up and down it by myself on a rope several times. I knew that I could do it. And so with the same kind of confidence that, that you know, you know that you can walk across that table without falling off. You're like, I know that I can walk down a sidewalk without falling. And, and then you just go and execute it. So, so that's the kind of. What, does it mean you were confident or had you memorized the route? How much preparation did that, that's 800 feet, right? How much did that take? Well, so that particular route is a very straightforward style. It's basically a one inch crack that just runs forever. So, uh, so it's the kind of thing that if you have the fitness for it, uh, you know, if you don't get too fatigued, your muscles don't get too tired, then it feels pretty safe the whole way. And so I didn't exactly memorize all the moves because you don't really have to because you just put your fingers in the crack and just crank on them. Um, but, but I knew that I could do it. So a few months later, you do your first free solo of half dough, which is like, more than twice the height, it's, it's yeah. 2,000 feet or so? Yeah, correct. 
and um, you're 150 feet from the summit, and you you kind of freaked out. So, what happened there that uh, hadn't happened on Moonlight? Well, so that's yeah, a sad, sad story. Everybody settle in for a sad, long story. So. <laughs> Uh, I mean, in a lot of ways, it was the opposite experience for Moonlight. And the thing about Moonlight is that there's... Uh, have many of you guys been to Zion National Park? I mean, have you guys all hiked up Angel's Landing or hiked up Moonlight? It's one of the most beautiful hikes in the country. But um, but there's a paved trail that goes all the way to the summit of, of Moonlight Buttress. So it's you know it takes maybe 40 minutes to stroll to the summit with a bunch of ropes, rappel down, and work on the climb. So it's really straightforward to work by yourself. Half Dome is the opposite end of the spectrum because it's, it's a 2,000 foot face, but it's also 2,500 feet above the valley floor. So you're doing almost 5,000 feet of vertical to get to the top. And then because it's a 2,000 foot wall, it's not really that, you know, I, didn't own, I don't own that much rope, you know, especially back then. Uh, you know, I didn't really know how you prepare something of that scale because it's just so big. And then, you know, some of my friends would be willing to climb the route with me, but but not really more than once, and I don't have that many friends, and it's, you don't want to burn through partners climbing the route over and over. Do, do, do you have friends now? I have more friends now. It's, it's been... Do but, you like friends? <laughs> no, you know. Anyone want to be Alex's yeah, yeah. friend? <laughs> no, no, I'm, I'm, good. I'm good with partners now, but the, the intervening 10 years have been good to me. But, but at the time, I was, uh, you know, I was all a little more grim. But so, but so the point with Half Dome was that it really, because I didn't quite know how to do the prep, prep work for it, I didn't really know how to... How to practice. Uh, so I sort of intentionally, and, and actually, so the physical rating on Half Dome, technically it's easier than, than Moonlight, the climb we were talking about before. So the combination of not really knowing how to prepare for it, but then also thinking that, well, technically, you know, physically it is easier, so this should be fine. I decided to take a different approach, which was to keep it a little more adventurous and just sort of rise to the occasion, you know, go up there and do my best and see how it goes. And, um, and you know, that's obviously didn't, didn't go that well. But you know, I, th I thought that it would be an okay It strategy. didn't go that well because you got a little lost on the route? Well, yeah, I got a little lost on the route. Um, I mean, so, so I'd done the bare minimum prep work, which is climbing, climbing the whole face with a friend of mine two days before with a rope. So I, I, knew that I knew roughly where to go, and I knew that I could do it. And then uh, I took a rest day. I sat in my car all day thinking about it, trying to, you know, get psyched. And then the next day I hiked up there by myself, did the climb, but didn't totally know where to go. Um, at the last second, kind of made an impromptu decision to bypass one of the sections that I'd climbed with the rope before. Um, so that involved climbing this whole section of the wall that I'd actually never been on. So, you know, you're a thousand feet off the ground, kind of wondering if you're off route, being like, oh, this, is, this seems unfamiliar. Like, I hope I can find my way back, <laughs> you know? And so, and the, the climb wound up taking me uh, almost three hours. I think it was 250. And so at the time, especially, I mean, that's still a long time, but especially then, that was a really long time for me to be fully focused and, you know, out there like that. Um, it was much... Just, can I interrupt you for a yeah, second? Yeah, of Just course. a general question. How important is speed for free soloing? It seems to me that speed aids because concentration wanes. Is that right? Uh, yeah, that's, I mean, that's sort of true, but I actually never intentionally try to go quickly. Um, I mean, I always keep track of my time because I... I care about that kind of thing. I like setting speed records. I think it's fun and, you know, it's cool. But, um, but I'm never trying to climb fast. Mostly when I've done big free solos, they've wound up being speed records sort of as a byproduct of the fact that I don't have a partner. I don't have to wait for, you know, I mean, typically when you climb, one person goes, waits for the other, and you kind of take turns the whole way. So it's relatively slow. Um, you know, so, I mean, the timing when you're free soloing just winds up being a lot faster just because you're not waiting for your partner. You don't have the weight of the rope hanging off you. You don't have all the gear on you. It just winds up being a little bit quicker. But I'm, but I'm never trying to go fast. And I think that overall it's safer to take your time and let your concentration, I don't know. I mean, it's a balance because, yeah, obviously your concentration starts to fade over time. But you definitely don't want to be hurrying up there either because then you make a careless mistake and fall to your death. So when you had those five minutes of, of, of panic... Um, like, how do you work your way out of that? Yeah, so, so, I mean, what, what Brett's mentioning is the, the whole half dome experience. I don't mean to bring up your most disgraceful moment as a climber. No, no, th that's far from my worst. We can, we can get to my worst moments later. Um, but, no, so, uh, yeah, towards the top of half dome is the actual physical crux of the route. And by then, you know, I was two and a half hours into this whole experience. My mind was starting to fray. It was all kind of going south. And, and then, yeah, I got to a part that was actually quite scary, and I didn't know what to do. And, and so then I spent... It probably isn't five minutes, though. It's probably 30 seconds, you know, but it feels like a lifetime of standing there thinking, oh, my God, I'm about to die. I don't know what to do. My foot's going to slip. I don't know, you know, oh, no, it's all coming apart. But the reality is, that, I mean, you're standing on these tiny, tiny little edges, and your calves are slowly getting pumped. And so, 
you know, what feels like a long time is probably probably 30 seconds. And then you make a decision and, and keep moving since, you know, I kind of had to since you can't just stand there indefinitely. So uh, your climb of Half Dome, I think, was what started to make you well-known outside of the climbing community. There was that famous picture of you uh, on, what's it called, Thank, Thank God Yeah, Ledge, Thank God Ledge, yeah. On Thank God Ledge on the cover of, of National Geographic. Uh, endorsements uh, started rolling in, money started rolling, people wanted to make films uh, about you. Money didn't quite start then, okay. but, but, it, but eventually I started to make a living, yeah. Well, at least uh, sponsorships, right? Yeah, no, that's true. But actually, it, most of my main sponsors had sort of happened right before then, yeah. and then that kind of solidified the fact that I could now eat. Well, let's yeah. get to the, yeah. I mean, let's get to the part where, where people start filming you. Um, the, one of the things you write, which cracked me up in the book, is I think you're in Borneo uh, or Indonesia somewhere, mm. and someone's filming you, and you, you say the experience is like being told, you know, dance monkey, like all of a sudden, like you've you've got to you've got to perform. So now you're not just climbing for the sake of the climb, for the sake of speed or or whatever it is. You're climbing for a, a whole team that has a set of of expectations. Just how does that, what do you have to do to prepare mentally and physically for the fact that you're now not just a climber or an athlete, you're a performer? Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, so, so that kind of crept up over the years. I mean, there definitely wasn't a point where I went from feeling like a climber to suddenly feeling like a performer. Um, it's more like, you know, one day every couple months, you have a day where you have to go out and perform. And then, you know, and that never really bothered me because, you know, I mean, we all have to to work somehow to support ourselves. And I'm like, I don't mind working on the rock sometimes. I mean, I'd much rather work while climbing than, than I mean, you know, I don't have, really have an education or any other skills. I'm like, I'd much rather be climbing than like laying brick or like roofing or something. You know, like I don't, you know, and so I mean, from that perspective, I'm like, this is, this is not a bad gig. You know, like, I mean, I like, I like climbing. So, but I mean, you're right though, that it does sort of change the experience a little bit. I mean, particularly with the free soloing, I mean, it's a little bit of a weird area because, you know, if you're risking your life, for a camera, it's like a bit of a weird thing. Though typically, um, I mean, if we really feel like diving into it, if we're having a chat, let's have a chat. Oh, this is all recorded though, huh? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. That guy just give a thumbs up in the back. Yeah, that's, this is recorded. Uh, yeah, but so I mean, most most filming is posed after the fact anyway. And so the filming on Half Dome, the photos, thank God ledge, things like that, those were all taken later. You know, when you just come back to the same climb, you rappel into position, you reclimb certain sections. Is that true of free solo? No, no, that's not true of free solo. That's why I won an Academy Award. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> well, but no, honestly, but that was a huge distinction yeah. for me personally, was because. You know, I had done a lot of filming and a lot of photography up to then. I mean, so I've also done a lot of work for brands. Uh, you know, I'm sponsored by by many different companies, and and it's totally common in the outdoor world to go out and do a photo shoot. You know, you choose some interesting looking piece of rock, you climb it over and over, you take nice pictures, you get the you know beautiful body positions. The the photographer tells you you know the best way to look on the rock, and you just do it. You just go out and like shoot for the day. You know, free solo was sort of my first experience where they were actually just filming what I did for two years. And, and in some ways, it was actually slightly annoying to me because I would have preferred having more guidance, more direction, because not that I'm calling Jimmy Chin a bad director, but, but um, you know, or his wife, Chai. Um, but the, the thing about it is that... Are there any scenes in the movie that you're embarrassed by? Oh, yeah, there are plenty of unflattering scenes in the film. Yeah, I mean, you've seen it, right? Three times. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, no, I mean... Wait, hang on. Does anyone think there's a single unflattering scene in the entire movie? No. Are you guys, no, have you seen the film? <laughs> no, it's, I mean, there, there are whole sections that I find horrifying. I'm like, well, oh no. Well, but, like, for example? Well, the, I mean, my whole relationship, you're just like, oh, that's kind of, <laughs> <like. laughs> Though, I mean, it's, it's hard. <laughs> We're like wandering into, a, into interesting terrain. Um, I mean, th the, the tough thing with that was because we started dating basically right when the film, right when they started filming with me. So a lot of the, the lines in the film where I'm talking about my girlfriend, and we're still together, things are great, Sonny's great. Um, yeah, yeah, thanks. thanks. Um, I'll, I'll tell her you applauded, she'll, she'll like it. Um, They're recording, so Oh yeah, oh yeah, watching. perfect. I hope she's not watching. Um, no, but so many of the things that I say about her in the beginning of the film 
were things that I said about a woman that I just started dating. We're a couple weeks into a relationship or like two months into a relationship. She hadn't really started climbing at that point. She was climbing, you know, very casually. So I have a lot of lines in the film where I'm like, oh, she's not really a climber. Like, we'll see how this plays out. You know, I'm not really that invested. You know, but it's like, oh, it's like casually dating somebody new. You know, now fast forward three and a half years later, you're like, it's slightly embarrassing to see that stuff. That's all I'm saying. Did you like, feel... Like, I could have I phrased things a little nicer, a little more nicely. But you must have felt you always had an option to just leave your personal life out of the film. Why did you choose to keep it in? Uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I never really felt that was an option. I mean, basically, from the beginning, I sort of just committed 100% to the project, and, you know... I trusted the filmmakers. I trusted trusted Chai Vassarelli and Jimmy Chin, the co-directors. You know, I've worked with worked with and climbed with Jimmy for years. You know, I know them. I trust them, and and I believed in their process. And I sort of, if this is what you guys need, I'll just you know. And in some ways, it's easier not to try to draw a line between that because I just did my thing for two years. I just did exactly what I wanted to do, and they hung out and filmed parts of it. And then, and I had no editorial control over the film at all. I didn't, you know, I didn't, I didn't even see it till the final draft. And then, you know, I saw it at the end and was like, oh, oh, geez. <laughs> like that's, you know. But at the same time, it's a totally honest film. I mean, I think they did actually did an incredible job of, of showing just the full picture. Are you yeah. surprised by what a mega hit it's become? Yeah, well, I mean, you know, I don't know. I'm partial to climbing films. I was like, I think it's pretty good. But, but no, it is, uh, <laughs> yeah, it is surprising how well it's, it's resonated with audiences things, yeah. But you've gone from being just simply, like, um, really admired in the climbing community and the world that knows it to being like famous. Um, and, and talk a little bit about sort of what it means to, to sort of just be well known, to be recognized. I'm, I'm guessing you're recognized all the time in airports, restaurants. How, how does it change you? What does it improve and what does it take away? Yeah, though, I mean, we're in Aspen. I feel like at least 15 people in this audience could come up and, and give the same answer, you know. Be like, well, you know, I They're wear my hoodie. They're curious to know yours. Oh yeah, well, well, I do the same things everybody else. I pull my hoodie down. I keep my no, um, no. It's just, it's just one of those things. I mean, the way I look at it, and yeah, it has actually been crazy with the film. Uh, being in public spaces is definitely a little, little different. Being in airports, like being in the subway in New York, is, is uh, gives me a lot of anxiety now. Because you get, I mean, as it is, it's really kind of claustrophobic. But then you wind up with like seven people staring at you, like you know, and you feel like a hunted animal, and you're like, oh no. And then, you know, you like pull your hood a little deeper and you're like, maybe I should exit, you know, maybe I'll connect to the L train right now. You know, you're like, it's all sort of, um, yeah, it's not ideal. But at the same time, you know, I mean, I made a bunch of choices that, that led to this. You know, I mean, I agreed to make a freaking film about myself. Obviously, I'm not going to complain that, that it wound up being too successful. I'm like, well, you know, I mean, basically, if you're going to if you're going to make a film, I mean, you want it to be the best possible film. And I'm like, well, they did a good job. So I on that, does it limit or expand your freedom? Uh, I mean, I mean, a little bit of both. Uh, you know, in some ways it limits my freedom for sure. I mean, so I was just in Yosemite this last month for, for a few days on and off, sort of in between. I've still been doing a lot of travel and, and events around the film and, and just a lot of work-related things, you know, obligations to sponsors and things. And so I had basically four climbing, three climbing days in Yosemite with one day of hiking. And so it spread throughout a couple of weeks, which which in some ways is a little sad for me because I'm used to just spending two months, two and a half months just living in Yosemite with, with nothing else going on. And so the timer just came on and that does seem extremely distracting. I feel like they're trying to hook us off the stage. <laughs> this is like the biggest numbers I've ever seen. Don't worry, don't worry. We're, we're going to ignore the numbers. We're going all night. So, so, the, the <laughs> so the thing about, about being in the Valley this season was that all the places that I used to hang out, all the trails that, I don't know, I mean, it just, it was a little too, too crazy. Like, I couldn't just, like, hang out in public spaces. Are you still free soloing? Uh, I mean, yeah, from time to time. I don't know. Yeah, nothing, I haven't done any serious free soloing since the film, I don't think. But, um, but it's kind of where you draw that line. I mean, today I went bouldering on Independence Pass, for, for those that live here and know, know the climbing, I did a couple highball boulder problems that, uh, and one of them was pretty freaking high, and getting to the top of the actual boulder is probably, I don't know, 25 feet off the ground. It's all sort of mossy, or like lichen-y, I guess, but slightly crumbly rock with lichen. And I was, I was like, oh, I haven't done this in a while. It's kind of scary. And I was like, I don't really want to fall 25 feet. So, like, <laughs> but. so uh, but actually, that's, that, that brings me to my next question. Uh, for me, I, I don't know if this is true for most people, but for me, the single most moving moment in the film is your first free solo attempt, I guess like October, November, 2016. 
and you start <coughs> before dawn, you're somewhere on um, one of the free blast slabs, mm. and you just stop, and, that, and you decide you're not continuing. You, you write, the fear I felt on the thin moves on free blast was telling me something. I needed to heed the warning. So what was that warning? Well, I mean, the warning is like, you're going to die. <laughs> um, I mean, but, you know, basically overwhelming fear, just like, oh, no. But, uh, I mean, so that was, so there's a specific move on the free blast labs where you have to trust your full body weight to a right foot. And I'd sprained that ankle pretty severely earlier in the season, and my foot was still kind of swollen, and my climbing shoes were really tight. And, you know, it was early November, so it was kind of cold out. And it was dark uh, just because of the way the timing is for that time of year. And so, you know, I was like, oh, it's dark, it's cold, I can't feel my toe, and I'm about to trust my life to standing on to the right toe, or the, the big toe of my right foot, and I can't feel it. And it was just this obvious, like, this is, like, I should not be here. Like, this is not for me. But um, one aspect, which, uh, after that, you, you, you go back down, um, and with, obviously, probably mixed emotions, but then you really prepared the route, and you learned things about the route that you didn't know before, like variations. Yeah. So, and, and you also had like an insight, which was that you were there to uh, free solo El Cap, not free solo free rider. So tell us about how like that changes the experience. Yeah, so what Brett's referencing is sort of, I had always felt like I was trying to free solo the route that I had climbed with the rope because, uh, you know, in some ways I felt slightly constrained in, in my vision of it because I'd climbed El Cap. You know, there are many different routes on El Cap and there, there's something like 100 different routes. And of those, maybe 15 or 20 of them can be free climbed, which means climbing uh, with just your hands and your feet, like not using any artificial gear to pull your way upward. Free climbing is an important distinction from free soloing, which means not using a rope and, and you know, still using your bare hands and feet type deal, but no rope either. So... Of the 20 routes up El Cap, or 15 routes up El Cap that can be free climbed, uh, the easiest one is, is the free rider, which is the one that the film is focused around. And so I sort of felt like I had to free solo that route. And then over the years, I sort of realized I don't really care which route I free solo, I just want to free solo El Cap. You know? And so all of a sudden, I started broadening my search quite a bit and swinging out far to the side of, of where you would normally climb with the rope. And where you climb the wall with the rope is sort of dictated by where the people did the first ascent and where they originally drilled the protection bolts. So they're basically metal bolts in the wall that you normally clip your rope into to protect you if you fall. And so when the people, you know, basically Royal Robbins, Yvon Chouinard did the first ascent of, of that section of the wall in 1961 or three or something, like basically early 1960s, they chose a certain path and everyone else has kind of taken that path since then. And it suddenly occurred to me that I didn't really have to take that path. I was like, I'm not gonna be clipping a rope into anything anyway. I'm gonna go wherever the heck I can find good holds. And so I started searching with a much broader eye, swinging all over the wall, looking for other variations. And so I wound up finding a couple ways to go around sections of the normal route that I felt safer doing. They, they just felt like more secure. And, and yeah, and so ultimately the route that I wound up climbing, you know, isn't exactly the free rider, but it's, it's pretty freaking close. But, you know, a few variations. Before your climb, you had a debate with your friend Tommy Caldwell, and, uh, who is uh, opposed to free soloing and described it as, in his own case, irresponsible and disrespectful to his family. And you said, I understood his point of view, but disagreed. So why? Well, yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, I don't know. I mean, uh, the thing about Tommy, so Tommy and I, it's not like one, one conversation we've had about this. I mean, we've talked about this all the time, and Tommy and I have spent probably hundreds of hours hiking together, hiking down from the top of El Cap, hiking to other mountains, we, you know, we spent four days sharing a sleeping bag together while climbing a thing in Patagonia. So I mean, we've had a lot of cozy time to chat together. <laughs> and so, and the thing is, I mean, he always, he loves to kind of play me off as like, oh, this bad influence, and you know, I'm the one free soloing, and Tommy's all safe. But Tommy and I basically do the same climbing. I mean, he doesn't explicitly free solo, but we do the same things in the mountains, we do the same thing speed climbing. We basically climb in totally the same style, except that, you know, except that he doesn't explicitly free solo. But so we take roughly the same risks in, in every other aspect of climbing. You know, we climb in very much the same way. Like when we're engaging in alpinism together, when we're climbing big snowy mountains together, we make the same decisions and, and we have the same threshold of safety. And so, and, and while we've been climbing mountains together, I mean, he has done quite a bit of free soloing with a rope on, meaning, you know, he technically is tied to a rope, but he's just, you know, but I'm not belaying him, let's say, because I'm dealing with something else. I'm like pulling the rappel line down, I'm coiling things up, I'm packing up our tent, like whatever, I'm dealing with other things, and he's just going up the next section of the wall with the rope. And so, you know, technically he's not free soloing, 
but I mean, he's not, you know, no one's going to catch him if he falls. You know, it's, it's all a bit of a gray area. You're sort of like, well, I don't know. Basically, I just think that we all sort of make intentional decisions about how we manage risk in our climbing. And I think it's, I'm not going to call it, Tommy's my personal hero since I was a little kid. I mean, he's the man and, you know, and, and he's from Colorado. He's, he's awesome. But, you know, it's slightly disingenuous to, to say that, you know, like, oh, he's not taking risk in his climbing, but I am. Because I'm like, you know, in many aspects of our climbing, we're taking all the same risks. I'm just choosing to pursue this one style of climbing that he's not into. And, you know, and I think that within free soloing specifically, I try to minimize my risk as much as possible the same way that when, when we're climbing mountains together, we try to minimize our risk as much as possible. I mean, basically, I think that we kind of have a very similar risk profile, but mine is just extended into another aspect of climbing that he's not interested in. So That's a very long, convoluted way to say that, you know, I mean, I think we're all just trying to make the best decisions that we can. So you, you but I have to ask this question because it's a stupid curiosity. You listen to music on, on when, when you're climbing, right? Yeah, sometimes. And, and is it John Denver? It's definitely not John Denver. I, I, I don't even know. No, I don't know what that is. No. <laughs> I mean, I've heard of John Denver. I just, it's, I think it's before my time. Who, 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 who do you listen to? I like modern rock, like punk like, type. Like it, just to pump you up? Yeah, that's all I listen to in general, really. Is it sort of like to just blare out the noise of your own? No, head? no, and that's actually the key thing, is I only listen to music when I'm climbing really easy terrain, uh, when, when I don't need to be fully focused. I actually prefer silence if, I, if what I'm doing matters. You, you, you get to the top of El Cap, uh, June 5th, 2017. Um, you actually look uh, happy. June 3rd, June 3rd. June 3rd, yeah, excuse yeah. me. No. We're so correcting been, the record for the recording. It's, yeah. oh, well, thanks for the correction. Um, uh, I remember you're, you're on the phone with Sonny. You're saying, I'm so delighted. H how long does that sense of satisfaction actually last? I mean, pretty, pretty long, actually. Uh, I mean, I was, I was smiling a lot for the whole week afterward. And then even now, if I watch the end of the film, if, we, if I get to talking about it, uh, I mean, it's pretty satisfying. Like, I am very proud of the effort I put into it and, and of the climb itself. Part of it, I mean, one thing that, that is tough about a climb like that is it's such a life ambition. It's, it's, it's unprecedented. It's not likely, well, I don't know, maybe it is likely to be repeated sometime soon. But what then becomes your next free solo of El Cap? What is an ambition, if there's any, that kind of equals it for you? I mean, I honestly don't know. Um, and that's Have you been kind thinking of... about it? Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, I've been thinking about it a bit, and, and honestly, that's been one of the biggest challenges of, of being on the film tour for the last six months and promoting the film and everything, is that every single movie screening, someone's like, what's next? Like, when's Free Solo 2? What are you working on? And you're like, man, I don't know. You know, I mean, El Cap all, is something... All the sequels are always worse except for The Godfather 2. That's the only <laughs> good sequel. That's, yeah, yeah, I don't think there, there's definitely no Free Solo 2, that's, that's for sure. Uh, yeah, no, I honestly don't know. I mean... So, I mean, are, but you're, you're, are you like talking to people? Like, what would be something that's really like? Well, I don't think talking to people would be the way anyway. I mean, it has to be something from the heart to some extent, something that inspires you, inspires me from within. Um, I mean, I've been working on on physically improving as a climber. You know, training, just trying to climb harder. Uh, you know, improve as a climber. I've, Do you think know. you could break two on on El Cap? Yeah, yeah, we did. We did last summer. You yeah, did? Su yeah, sub two hours on El Cap. Oh, my Actually, God. Actually, there'll be a whole 45-minute film about that. Uh, oh, about well, there you season. go. Yeah. So, but it's not Free Solo 2. It's, uh, I don't know what it's going to be called. But, um, but so for those uh, here who are real climbers, the Real Rock Tour this year, which is a climbing film tour that travels all over the world, will have this 45-minute film about me and Tommy climbing El Cap in, in uh, sub two hours which was our big goal last year. But that's kind of, so that's well, actually I, been I the really that. interesting thing is everyone asks, what's next post El Cap? But so um, this will be a long ramble here, so, so settle in. But so part of, part of my process for, for free soloing El Cap was to not build it up too big in my mind. Uh, you know, I mean, obviously it was this dream that I had forever. It was really important to me, but I didn't want to, but, but I, was, I had been physically able to climb El Cap without falling since 2008 or nine or something. So basically, you know, it'd been almost 10 years that, that I was physically able to, you know, that's kind of the bare minimum to consider free soloing El Cap is that you obviously have to be able to climb from the bottom to the top without falling off or using your rope at all. And so technically I'd been there physically for quite a long time. And so really it was the mental side that, that took so many years to develop and, you know, it took a long time for me to feel confident doing it. And anyway, so because of that, I didn't want to build it up too big in my mind because I didn't want to put too much more pressure on the mental side of it. I didn't want to 
put it on this pedestal as like, this will be the craziest thing ever done. This is so extreme. This is the hardest thing that any human can imagine. You know, I didn't want to like put it way up here when the reality is that physically, you know, I was capable. I just had to actually do it. And so part of the way that, that I kept it from putting it too high in my mind was to kind of treat it as one of many other climbs during the year. So I had all my normal, as a professional climber, you basically go on expeditions, you, uh, you know, you work on other climbing goals. So right after, uh, right after I did the free solo, actually, I went on an expedition to Alaska with some of my teammates on the North Face team and to climb big mountains uh, near Denali. Well, not that, but 5,000 foot rock walls. And so, not really mountains, you know, but, but big walls. And so, and that was specifically training for a North Face expedition in uh, that winter, going to Antarctica to climb first ascents of big walls which was something, was an incredible experience for me, something totally new for me, you know, really character building, because I don't really ski that well, and to like live on skis in Antarctica, climbing big granite walls, it was, you know, it was incredible. But, and then later in the year, Tommy and I did the speed record on the nose. And so the point is I had all these other big climbing goals lined out in front of me. And so I, I free sold little cap, I immediately went to Alaska, I practiced my skiing a bit, climbed some mountains, that got me ready for Antarctica. You know, I trained a bit more during the springtime, then Tommy and I did the speed record. Is your, is your physical stamina, like, it's not slowed down at all. How, or, or are you still improving? Or are you feeling like you're old age? No, oh, it's, I mean, well, obviously I've already begun my decline. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm 33. I'm, you know, I'm halfway, halfway done. No, actually looking around the room, I'm like, oh no, you guys. <laughs> um, no, no, I mean, I don't know. It's hard, it's hard to say. Um, actually, I'll, I'll get to that in one second though. Because so my point with the, the whole thing is that I did all that climbing and then the film came out. And then so since then, it's been you know, seven months of touring with the film, going to the Academy Awards, doing the whole crazy thing. And so now every day, people are like, what's next? And in some ways, I'm like, well, I already did what's next. You know, I did the climb, and then I kept doing interesting things for a year. I kept challenging myself as a climber. I did several things that I'm quite proud of. You know, climbing El Cap in sub two hours had been, had been a bit of a dream as well. And I mean, we were pretty proud of it when we did it. We're like, that's awesome. But of course, it's overshadowed by this incredible film that goes on to win an Academy Award. And so, you know, it's a little bit weird for me to be like, what's the next big thing? I'm like, I don't know, I'll just keep chipping away at it. I'll keep setting goals for myself. I'll keep trying to improve. I'll keep doing things. You know, I mean, who knows if they'll ever be, I mean, basically they'll never be as good a film about it. So it's like, it, you know, for the mainstream public, no one's ever going to be like, that's incredible in, in the same way. But, but for me personally as a climber, it's, it's fine. You know? Do you ever imagine a future without climbing? Uh, no, no, I don't think so. Um, does, does Sani? No, she, I mean, she loves climbing, too. We yeah. climb together all the time. Um, I mean, there will almost certainly be a future where I'm not pushing as hard at climbing, where it's not my every thought, when I'm not training all the time, when I'm not worried about my diet, when, you know, when I'm just casually climbing for my own fun. Um, but, you know, we'll see when we get there. One of the things I want to ask you about before we turn to audience questions, because this is important, is uh, I'd like you to talk about a bit about the Honold Foundation, what, what it is, what you're doing, what your ambitions are for it. Uh, yeah, so the Honol Foundation uh, is, you know, I, I've started it five, I don't know, seven years ago, I guess. That makes me feel old, speaking of aging. Um, so I started it many years ago, and, and uh, we've been giving grants to other nonprofits, basically supporting solar projects around the world, supporting energy access. And, uh, and I mean, I guess the long answer of it is that, uh, I don't know, I mean, how, how, do you, how deep we should, should we go in this audience? Go for it. Um, yeah. Well, okay, so when you ask about what's next, I mean, honestly, the foundation projects that we're working on right now are a big part of what's inspiring me and sort of motivating me right now because I've been doing so much traveling with the film that, you know, I just don't have any big climbing dreams right now. But some of the work that we're, you know, uh, we're supporting the, the first cooperative solar microgrid in Puerto Rico, um, which is potentially the island's first. Um, nice, nice. Um, and so... And so a month or two ago, I went to Puerto Rico, visited the community group that we're, that we're working with, you know, saw the project, saw the, the businesses that, that will be affected by it, you know, and, and it was incredible. I mean, it's pretty, it was personally very satisfying. I was like, oh, this is, you know, I mean, this is great. And so, you know, when people ask what's next, I'm kind of like, well, I don't know. I mean, people want to hear Free Solo 2 or like some rad climbing objective. But the reality is that I'm pretty content training in the gym, improving as a climber, working with the foundation, you know basically living life and sort of seeing how it plays out, you know, just trying to do something useful in the world while still trying to improve, as, you know, at what I do. Um, I don't know. It's just not a sexy answer, And, and, and if know? someone wants to get linked up to the Honold Foundation, what do they do? Um, so, honoldfoundation.org. Uh, you can see all the projects that we've supported over the years. You can see the type of 
projects that we're supporting currently um, around the world. We're mostly focused on the Americas for the next couple of years just because it's slightly easier to oversee. But um, but yeah, I mean, reach out to HanaFoundation.org, go to the executive director, who's this incredible woman, who's and uh, you know, basically we're just we're just working away. I think later later in the summer, uh, I'm going to be going to Detroit to do a project there. It's more more domestic, but uh, you know, I'm still very much an area with with some need. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's nice. Um, we're going to now start doing questions. Uh, I guess I'll call people um, and. But I'll cut you off if you start bloviating. So um, ask a question, um, like one, two sentences, question mark, and then you're good. Um, so there's a young woman right here. Uh, uh, there you are. Maybe just tell us your name and stand up and ask a question. Hi, I'm Maddie Mominy from the Bezos Scholar Foundation. And I was wondering what inspired you to start climbing? Uh, there wasn't a specific thing that inspired me. I just always loved climbing. As a little kid, I climbed on things. I loved climbing trees and buildings and whatever else. And then, uh, and then a climbing gym opened in Sacramento, which is where I'm from. And so my parents read about it in the newspaper, and they just took me to the climbing gym because they thought it'd be a more structured outlet for, you know, I mean, it's better than me jumping off the roof and playing around at home. And you know, they were sort of like, oh, at least this way you can do it properly with padded floors and ropes and all that kind of thing. And so then, uh, obviously, I loved climbing in the gym, and then did that for the rest of my life, basically. <laughs> but still going to the gym all the time. Um, up here, this gentleman. Hey, uh, would you consider releasing all four hours of footage, pretty please? Uh, I mean, I have no say in it. I, you know, I don't have any, like I said, I had no editorial control over the film. I mean, I would actually be sort of interested in seeing that too, but I think it'd be pretty boring. Uh, you know, it's hard to say. Because, I mean, the reality is that free soloing is, is pretty, you know, it's a nice even pace, it's pretty mellow. I mean, there's a lot of easy climbing on El Cap. Um, it just, you know, I mean, it'd be four hours of just trotting up the wall. <laughs> yeah. I and, think and, the, and the I'm answers sure. people would love if someone Well, if, there's if also, they, they'd have to censor out a bunch of full frontal nudity, because obviously I peed off the wall like six times or something, <laughs> you know, and a few things like that, but that's fine. It'd be rated R. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, um, let's see, uh, someone from this side, yes. Um, I wanted to know what motivated you to keep achieving these extraordinary goals. Um, I don't know. I mean, I, I think for me, part of it is the fact that I've always felt like I can do a little bit better. Uh, I think that the real motivation is improving, and, and in some ways all these, you know, what you call incredible uh, achievements or goals or whatever you said, uh, I mean, they're just, they're just ways of sort of measuring improvement for me. You know, I, I like to take on slightly bigger challenges. I like having slightly more complex challenges. And so you just keep, you know, I've always been all about incremental progress. I mean, it's funny because the, the solos that we talked about were sort of big milestones for me in my climbing. But I've done, um, I think, maybe 35 free solos that are the first, you know, first free solos are things that I'm sort of proud of. And really, when you lay them all out, 35 of them, it's, I mean, it's a, lot, it's a long, long road that eventually culminated with El Cap for me. You know, it's like many, many small steps in, in different directions until, until I finally was able to actually climb El Cap. Um, uh, right here in the middle, uh, yeah. Hey, um, I was just curious what impact your growing fame has had on your mental stability and clarity when you climbed today compared to, say, five, ten years ago? Um, I think overall it hasn't had that big of an impact. I mean, so I think obviously when I'm climbing in climbing gyms and everyone's staring at me, it's, you know, slightly distracting and, and a little bit harder to perform in the way that I'd like, you know, it's, it's hard to totally shut that aside. Um, but I don't know. I mean, you know, I went out climbing on the past day and, and it, I felt just like, you know, it, it felt just like any other day of climbing. It was incredible. Um, so, I mean, uh, yeah, I don't think it's had that big of an impact. I mean, to some extent, I think that's what I love about climbing is the fact that it forces you to focus 100% on what you're doing. And, and, you know, really that's the joy of climbing is that you're so in, you know, in the actual activity of it that, that you're not self-conscious about those kinds of things. Um, oh, okay, well, yeah, the eagerness counts. So definitely over there. Yeah. Oh, no, they're all heckling. I know them, and I don't like them. <laughs> well, we have a question, because... Just have dinner. Yeah. Um, Emily and I have both watched you solo um, in person, in real life, and it was 
absolutely horrifying. Yeah, that's fair. Um, but you also were witness to one of the more horrifying free solos. I was. Actually, well, that's not totally true. So for those who don't <laughs> know, they're both also professional climbers that were all on the North Face team. So they're heckling and they should be removed. No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> but we, I, I do have a legitimate question yeah, yeah, with, okay, with on the regards to free soloists. How did you feel knowing that your friends were watching you? Like it, it talks about it in the film a little bit, but actually really, how did you feel? Yeah, um, I mean, I don't want to sound too callous, but I didn't totally care. I mean, I knew that, you know, I, I know it's super stressful to watch, and I don't like watching other people free solo if, if they're pushing hard. Uh, I mean, it's, it's really stressful to watch. It's, you know, I mean, it's, did, you, did you get stressed out watching the movie? Like, no, no, no. I, I mean, that doesn't stress me out because I'm like, oh, that's, that's me at my best. I'm like, that's awesome. Uh, no, but, but watching a lot of my friends, you know, I have a lot of other friends that have sold things, and it's, yeah, I mean, it can be stressful. But, um, but no, I mean, I think that, that the main thing was that I cared about my own safety more than they cared about my safety, basically. I, I mean, I kind of already knew that I, was, that I was being as careful as I could be, that I was preparing as much as possible. And so I knew that it was super hard for them to watch, but at the same time, I also knew that I was only going to, to do the climb if I felt totally comfortable, and, and if I felt comfortable, it should be okay for, you know, they should be able to hold it together, basically. I don't know. Um, I mean, I know it's, it, yeah, it's slightly, I don't know. It's, there's no great way to say that. But, but they're professionals, you know? It's, they just have to put on their, yeah, I don't know. Up here put on a front. brave face. Yeah. Thank you. First of all, thank you. This has been an amazing conversation. Really, really great to have you here. Um, Alex, in the film, your personal life is really sort of on display, not just the unflattering stuff, stuff that you thought was unflattering in the beginning of your relationship, but there's like, you know, filmmaker prerogative and what's shown and what's not shown. And there's a sort of story arc to your personal development that goes along with your development as a climber and your, your breakthroughs in climbing and your personal breakthroughs. How, how real was that and how much of that was licensed by the director? And, I mean, did you feel like you had a sort of true personal breakthrough in, in your capacity to have a relationship and be you know, committed to somebody? Um, I don't, uh, she's a psychologist. No, no, no. I'm, I'm about ready to lay down on the sofa and just open up. <laughs> I'm, I'm ready. Um, no, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I, don't, you know, I do, definitely don't think that they took any creative license with it. I mean, I think that it's all honest. It's all in there. I mean, there are a couple things that, um, like, so, for example, with, with my relationship with my girlfriend, uh, at the end of the film, I say I love you on the summit of the, the mountain as I'm hiking down. And the, many audiences interpret that as the first time I say I love you to her because it's the first time it's shown. That, I mean, that's not the case. I mean, we've been dating for two years already. You know, I try to use the L word sparingly, but it does come out from time to time. <laughs> and, and so... You know, I mean, I wouldn't call that artistic license, though. I mean, I think that, I mean, because that is an honest moment that, you know, every, everything in the film happened. You know, like, it's all honest. It's all there. You know, but they had 700 hours of footage that they had to condense down to a 90-minute film. Obviously, they did it in the best way that they could. So, I don't know. I mean, yeah, I think there's some legitimate... Well, I mean, honestly, I would hope that anybody has some kind of actual personal growth over two years of, you know, over two years of life. Uh, <laughs> You know, I mean, and, and Sonny, uh, Sonny's an incredible woman, and she definitely has pushed me on a lot of those things as well, you know. I mean, she's kind of required me to be slightly better in some ways, and so, you know, I've done my best to, 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 to meet her expectations, you know. But um, Over, let's go to the far side, this young man in green. Oh, awesome. What's your worst free soloing moment? Oh. Good question. Well... We are going all night. No, they're, they're, they're plenty. I don't know. So it uh, depends what you mean by worst. I mean, so the closest that I've come to falling off things has, has definitely been, I've had maybe a half dozen experiences where I've broken holds or things, you know, things have suddenly happened where like a hold snaps off the wall. But the thing about those is that in some ways they aren't my worst moments because they're over before you even realize what happened. Basically, if something breaks off and you don't fall off the wall, then, you know, by the time you realize that you broke a hold, you already didn't fall off. And so basically all there is to do is take a breath and just, you know, compose yourself and sort of carry on. Um, it's kind of like, you know, if you narrowly avoid a car accident or something. I mean, by the, time, by the time you know what happened, the accident's already avoided. So there's nothing really to be afraid of at that point, even though you still feel a big rush of adrenaline and your body starts to shake and it can be all traumatizing. But, you know, the reality of it is that the, 
that the dangerous situation has already passed at that point. So I think that most of my most dangerous situations in free soloing weren't really that scary because they just happened instantly and thankfully, uh, you know, they didn't wind up being catastrophic. Uh, most of the scariest experiences were sort of things like Half Dome that are sort of long, you know, mounting dread where you're like, am I off route? Like, will I ever make it to the top? Who knows if this is the right? Um, actually, particularly when I was younger and I was sort of learning how to free solo, I had a bunch of experiences where I was really bad at reading topos, which is the, the maps that people draw for where routes go. I used to be really bad at interpreting like what's a left facing corner, what's a right facing corner, where's the crack, where's the little roof, you know? So, so now you can like look at the map, look at the wall and be like, okay, I'm gonna go up there and then left and then up and it's gonna be perfect. But when I was younger, I would just sort of like, oh, I think this must be the one. And then I'd climb halfway up it and be like, I don't remember the map saying there were supposed to be bolts on this route. And then be like, why am I passing bolts? And then suddenly realize that I was like 500 feet away from the route that I thought I was supposed to be on and I was actually just on the wrong wall. And you're like, oh no, and then start to panic. And then, you know, so really I think that experiences of mounting Red have always been the hardest. That's the long answer, but. Uh, another one over here, you, sir. Uh, I, I know that your max climbing grade is obviously higher than the grade that you're willing to necessarily solo at. What uh, grade would you solo at at this point? What's kind of the max grade that you would consider? Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's not really a grade thing. It's basically how secure does it feel. And that's kind of the challenge of El Cap. I mean, El Cap isn't actually really that hard of a grade by comparison. The the, the technical difficulty grade of El Cap is, is a grade at which I often warm up on at, at a sport crag, like when I'm just out for a normal day of climbing at a cliff with a rope. You know, that's what I would kind of consider uh, generally my second warm up of the day. You know, once I kind of get limbered up a little bit, I'm like, okay, I'm still still warming up. So, I mean, you can't really compare the, the grade. I mean, it really just comes down to how secure you feel while you're doing that style of climbing. But no. uh, Let's go in the middle with this guy Waving his arm. He's frantically waving. He must be psyched. <laughs> I'm not a climber, uh, so this is maybe a naive question, but it seems like uh, my assumption is it's easier to climb up than it is to climb down. So if you, is there a point of no return where you have to keep going up? So that's not totally true. I mean, so down climbing, uh, so it is fair to say that in general, climbing up is easier than climbing down. And part of that's just because when you're climbing up, you can see where your hands are going. But when you're climbing down, it's really hard to see where your feet are going just because they're blocked by your own body. So it's basically hard to see. But there are some styles of climbing that are a lot easier to go back down, like say chimneys or you know certain types of crack, you can kind of slide back down them. And it's actually physically a lot easier to go down. Um, I think the biggest difference though is that most people find it easier to go up because that's all they ever practice. Uh, very few climbers spend a lot of time down climbing, so they're just not used to that, that style of movement. But I have spent a lot of time down climbing because that's really an important part of free soloing is to feel comfortable reversing things. And so in general, I feel pretty comfortable reversing almost everything that I've soloed. Uh, I mean, that's not totally true on something like El Cap because it's just so big and so hard and you know, it's such an undertaking. Um, that, that typically it's probably better just carry on to the top than, than reverse uh, you know, the thousands of feet that you've climbed. But, um, but in general, uh, you know, down climbing is an important thing for Zola. Um Next question. Uh, I see hands way in the back on the left. Wait for the microphone. Hi, I'm Sarah. Thank you. Uh, this is actually a question from my boyfriend. He wants to know, um, how many times on free solo did you come down to like one feature? Like where maybe three limbs were off. <laughs> oh, I see what you're saying. I mean, basically how often was my life depending on a single limb? Yeah. Um, uh, I don't know. I mean, I have to count all the different, think about all the moves on the route, but they're probably, um, you know, a couple places basically. But I mean, specifically that move we were talking about on the free boss lab where your whole weight is on one foothold um, just for a moment. Um, there are probably a couple other things sort of like that. Um, but there are tons of places on the route where if a single thing slipped, you would fall off. I mean, like, uh, you know, not to say that you're only using one limb, but if you're in counter pressure between one hand and one foot and you're pushing between them, if either of them slipped, then obviously you're no longer in counter pressure. You're just pinwheeling backward off the wall. So, you know, so there are whole sections of the wall that are climbing in that kind of style that, you know, require all of your limbs to stay on the wall. Um, let's go to the center. There's a lady waving her hand right here. Hi, my name is Belize. I wanted to ask about your climbs where you use a gear. Um, what are the notable improvements that you've 
had with um, gear and are there any innovations that you would recommend or um, have had change with the gear that you use? That's, that's in, in all my months of touring, nobody's ever asked about innovations in gear and I appreciate that. Um, <laughs> Uh, so, yeah, I mean, over the 20 years that I've climbed, there definitely have been big improvements in gear, but they're sort of all incremental, I think, for the most part. Uh, things get a little lighter. Uh, I mean, particularly with climbing hard goods, like the actual equipment that you're putting into the rock, it's all gotten a little bit safer, a little bit lighter. Uh, ropes have gotten thinner, uh, which means that they weigh less and they're easier to, to pull behind you. Um, I mean, in general, it's all just gotten slightly easier, but, but nothing groundbreaking, you know? Sort of in the same way that apparel continues to get better. You know, you're a little bit warmer, a little bit lighter, a little bit more waterproof or better wicking, you know, things like that. But, but at the same time, I mean, you're still wearing clothes. I mean, you're, you know, so, um, yeah. I mean, it hasn't, hasn't totally changed the game, but, but it is nice to have lighter mountain boots, lighter equipment. It's all, it just means that you can climb a little faster, basically. Is nude climbing going to become a thing? <laughs> not, not by me, <laughs> but... No, actually, I mean, and so speaking of that, so climbing's in the Olympics next year. So climbing's in the 2020 Olympics. And, and climbing in general has been booming as a sport. And so it, I am personally sort of curious as to where, you know, what happens if more money comes into climbing, if there's more innovation. Because there hasn't really been any major changes in equipment in, in a long time. Uh, it'll be interesting if people really push it in new directions. Uh, the, yes, uh, you. <laughs> Hi, Alex. Um, I hate to get back to your relationship, but <laughs> if your first film was called Free and then Solo, what would the next one be called? <laughs> well, I mean, the film crew always jokes that it's still solo when, when Sonny leaves me and I'm back to living in the van, you know, but... Uh, but I think the answer she was looking for was married with children. Oh, yeah, but isn't, isn't that a TV show? Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, that sucks. I don't want that. Well, we'll see. We'll see. I meant the show sucks. I'm sure life will be great, but... <laughs> okay. Um, uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, wait for the mic so we can record you. Is there someone there? Thanks. You're really making poor mic runners just really get their exercise. You got it. So first question, are you still eating off the spatula? <laughs> and the second question is about the MRI in your brain. So do you really think that, I mean, did I understand correctly that the test said that you experience less fear than another person would? Okay, so first with the spatula. Uh, I mean, when I'm in the van, yeah, I often eat off the spatula still. I mean, the whole point of eating off the spatula is you don't scratch your pan, you have fewer dishes, it's very efficient, it's very practical. I strongly encourage everybody to do it. <laughs> Actually, um, anyway, the amygdala thing, uh, we were chatting about a bit backstage earlier, but basically, uh, I mean, what, what exactly is your question? If I don't feel fear the same as other folks, or? So, yeah, so I think that, uh, for those that haven't seen it in the film, there's this, you know, maybe 30 second scene where I take an fMRI, they scan my brain, um, and it basically shows no activation in my amygdala, uh, which is sort of the fight or flight center of the brain, uh, during this specific round of tests. But the takeaway from that wasn't so much, but, but the thing is it's there and it works fine. Um, just don't get me wrong, it's, it's all good. Um, the thing was that basically through years and years of practice, I've desensitized myself to certain levels of stimulus, I think. And that's kind of the takeaway of talking with a researcher and, and uh, and there's a full feature-length article about that exact, I mean, the reason I was taking that fMRI was for an article for Nautilus magazine, it was a science magazine. And so if you're interested, read the article, dive in deep to it. But basically, over years of exposure to scary situations, I've sort of desensitized myself to the point that the, the test that you take where you're laying in a tube and you're looking at images, I was like, I didn't, I didn't find it very scary because it's not, you know, because it's not dangerous at all. But had they thrown a snake into the fMRI with me, I'm sure my amygdala would have lit up like a Christmas tree and you'd be like, oh, geez, you know. But so, you know, I saw it as all perfectly rational, totally normal. And I was like, of course my, my brain's not going to light up looking at black and white photos while I lay here perfectly comfortable and safe inside a tube. I was like, that's stupid. But apparently the, the average human mind does react to the images the same, you know, as if they were actually experiencing it. But I think it's because the average person hasn't, you know, 
been scared out of their mind for years and years and years, you know, having near-death experiences over and over, you know. Okay. Uh, <laughs> um, there is a young woman directly in front of me, uh, in the middle there, raising your hand. Yeah. Coming from both sides. Such a, this is a big moment for the mics. <laughs> Um, so when, so when you're climbing with other people, do you, um, like when they gave you, when they give you beta on a route or no? Yeah. So when she's, so beta is what it's called when, when, uh, you get a method for how to climb something. And so it's really common for climbers to tell each other, you know, like raise your left foot and sag your right, your right hip and, you know, open up to the wall and grab that with your left hand. Like that's what's referred to as beta. I freaking love it. Um, I, Whenever I get to climb with folks who are who are much better than me, it's such a pleasure to have somebody just tell you like, here's how you should do it, and you're like, oh, it's so nice. I find it. I mean, actually, so today I was climbing with two guys who were both very good climbers, and it was really nice to be able to share a beta. They were also both slightly taller than me, and and big and strong, strapping men, and so it was kind of nice to have people who were roughly the same size, roughly the same strength, be able to just tell me like, here's how you do it, and just you know, I was like, oh, it's such a pleasure. It's like having a guided tour. Yeah, I love that. Um, some 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 people really hate it though. Yeah, I mean, particularly if you're climbing in a commercial gym, it's like kind of poor form to just yell advice at somebody that you don't know, being like, "Raise your left foot," and they're like, "F you." I'm like working it out for myself, you know. Uh, but I I like it. Um, on the left, right there. Yeah. So I'm not a professional climber either, but I had a question as an ultra runner. I always carry water with me. How did you do that whole climb with no water? I didn't. I stashed a liter of water and a little bit of food in two different places on the route. So, um, oh. and, and that's part of the appeal of having a camera crew and having stuff like that is that it makes the logistics a lot easier because for them to get into position to film the climb, they had to repel huge sections of the wall. So they were able to stash some food and water for me. Uh, they carried my, my sneaker, you know, my, my shoes up to the summit so that I didn't have to pre-stash them ahead of time. You know, all the things that they did for me are things that I easily could have done myself a couple days before with a lot more planning and, and foresight. But because they're filming, it just makes it pretty easy where the morning of, you're just like, here are all my snacks. Put them, you know, put them up there when you go. It's like, no. Yeah, I mean, and, and honestly, that's one of the reasons that I've agreed to work with film crews over the years is because you know that in some ways it does make your actual climb easier or it makes your own logistical process easier. Uh, this side of the room, um, sir with a white shirt, yep. So when you think about um, the limits of what you can do, is that defined by what you think, what's physically possible, or your intuition? Uh, I mean, I think it's mostly limited by what's physically possible. I mean, you know, there are some things that I just can't do. I mean, there are some little edges that I cannot pull with my fingers, uh, you know. I mean, that's, I mean, so if you're talking about specifically with free soloing, I think that being able to physically do something is the base. And then beyond that, you know, whether or not you mentally can, can do it, uh, you know, that's, I mean, that's kind of the extra step. But, um, but there's this whole physical layer at the bottom that, I mean, if you can't do it, you can't do it. And, and to me, the physical side has always come harder. Like, I'm not, actually, the guy heckling me over there, that guy, freakishly strong fingers, very, very strong, naturally gifted in a way that I never have been. And so, you know, the physical side for me has always taken a lot of work, a lot of, you know, a lot of training, a lot of effort, and I still just can't really be that strong. I, I hope Maddie's psyched over there. He's, he's single, by the way, in case anyone's interested. But, um, yeah, that's him. He's, he's, he's living out of a tent, I think, but you know, it's pretty cool. But, but anyway, so for, for some climbers, you know, the physical side comes easier and the mental side is really hard. For whatever reason, the mental side has always been slightly easier to me, but, but the physical side is, is still a struggle. I mean, it's just not that easy to pull yourself up on a tiny little edge. You know, it's... Okay, um, I'm just trying to go, uh, now you asked a question already. Uh, Guy in um, black right there. Yeah, yeah, whoever Alex pointed to. Yeah, yeah, the guy right next to the microphone at the black, yeah. It's all about keeping it right by the mic and it's easy. Yeah. Hey, Alex. It, it seems like any time a new record in any sport is set that no one ever did before, somebody else comes along and duplicates it. What you did doesn't seem like it's readily duplicable. Is there someone in your community, or have you met someone who said, I'm gonna do what you did? 
and in, in a way that's credible, that's believable and possible? Or is this something that's years and years away from being replicated? Well, so, yeah, it's an interesting question, and, and it's really hard to know for sure, because like I was just saying, I mean, there's such a difference between the physical side of it and the mental side of it. And so physically, there are probably, you know, there are many people on, on Earth right now climbing who, who can physically climb El Cap without falling off. Um, you know, I mean, there are, I don't know, maybe 20 people or something who could potentially walk up to the base, climb from the bottom to the top without falling. You know, but none of them, none of them free solo, and none of them really have the drive for it, none of them necessarily want to. But conceivably, if any of them were just like, screw it, I don't care about living or dying, I'm just going for it, you know, I mean, one of them potentially could. So, I mean, in some ways, I've always, I've always kind of, you know, darkly joked that, that the right person just has to have a bad breakup, and then they'll just go and do it, <laughs> you know? And, you know, so, yeah. Well, I mean, okay, no, so to bring it back full circle, though, so Tommy Caldwell went through a really difficult divorce many years ago, and, and he did have a moment. He's the most successful cap climber ever. He put up most of the other free routes on the wall. The climbing shoes that I was wearing are named after him, you know, the, the Tommy Caldwell Pro model. Like, he designed them for climbing on all cap. He's an incredible climber. And so he was going through this very difficult divorce, and, he, you know, he had a moment where he was sitting on top of this route, you know, looking over at all cap, being like, I should just go over there and solo that. You know, because I mean, I don't know, sometimes you have dark days. And, and he is somebody who physically could. You know, I mean, he, you know, if he was in the right mood, potentially he could. And so it's kind of a weird thing, though, because, you know, I don't think that anyone's actively trying to. I don't think that anyone really wants to. I don't think that anyone's really in the right place that they, they should. But you never really know. I mean, somebody could. But, I mean, time will tell. Though, if history is any guide, most of the other big cutting edge free solos haven't really been repeated for 20 years or so. And so, you know, it seems to be sort of a generational thing, but, you know, time will tell. Um, we are over time, but I'm told we can go over time. So are you good with that? Yeah, I mean, whatever you guys want. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We're just partying. Okay, so um, I'm, yes, over there. Maybe just a, f a few more questions, and then um, I'm happy to hang out and chat with whoever, whoever wants to afterward, and so... You know, don't feel like we're holding you hostage, but, but if okay. folks are interested, we can, we're happy to chat as long as you guys want. Okay, great, thank you. What would be an activity that you would be too freaked out to do? Like skydiving or? Oh, like knitting, you know? <laughs> <laughs> like, like ballroom, dan ballroom dancing, like, oh goodness. Um, no, I don't know about freaked out. I mean, in general, I don't, I don't know, public performance, like if I had to sing opera, I'm like, you know, that's, that's not for me. I don't know. <laughs> Thanks so much for this, by the way. Uh, this is a real treat. And I was just curious as to, I mean, I'm sure this theme has been beaten, beaten to death here, but uh, I'm wondering what your risk assessment kind of strategy is, how it's changed over the last couple decades, and maybe kind of who your mentors are in that, or if there are any, or if you're, you know, studying risk assessment. I know it's a big deal in other sports, you know, pilots, yeah. kayaking, what so, have you. So I've never explicitly Thanks. studied risk assessment. I don't technically know anything about it, um, you know, from, from a education standpoint. Um, though I have had, you know, countless conversations with people like Tommy Caldwell, other climbers, you know, peers, and I mean, and even conversations like this. I mean, basically, climbers talk about risk and managing risk all the time because it's such an important part of, of the sport. I mean, it's, it's, you know, sort of at the core of, of climbing is how do you manage the, the risk associated with it? You know, I don't know, what was the first half of the question? <laughs> like, oh, how, how has my process changed over time? Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I think that maybe my biggest development has been sort of accepting, I don't know, I think as I've gotten older, I've sort of accepted that even though something might feel like 100%, realistically, it's never 100%. There's just always, I mean, I've just seen too many friends have terrible accidents, too many, you know, unfortunate things happen, them, happen in the mountains. And so, you know, I've kind of realized that, that even if something feels 100, you know, I mean, it never actually is 100. And and in a lot of ways, I've actually really limited my, my easy soloing now because I feel like that's kind of where I'm rolling the dice the most. Um, when I was younger, I had a lot of 
kind of high mileage days where I was going out and climbing things that were physically easy, but tons and tons of them, like say 50 routes in a day or something. And, um, and I think that was a really important way for me to sort of build my base and to feel comfortable soloing and to, you know, to grow as a climber. But I pretty much don't do that at all anymore because I recognize that even if it's an easy route and I feel totally fine on it, there is, you know, a slight chance that something's just randomly going to break or something, something random is going to happen. Um, just because I have, you know, I basically know many people who have had accidents like that and you're sort of you're like, well, so, I mean, I guess that, yeah, I'm a little more conservative over time, which is ironic because you watch the film Free Solo and you're like, oh, that guy's crazy. But, but in a lot of ways, that actually represents me reining it in quite a bit because I trained for two years to do one climb that I really cared about as opposed to just going for it. You know, I mean, had I just not really cared about it, I could have just tried on day one. You know, it probably would have worked out. Probably, you know, 85% chance would have worked out fine and, and there wouldn't be a movie. You know, but instead I, I wanted to get to 100, so I spent two years working on it. And... And it's funny because people watch free solo and they're like, oh, so much free soloing. But I mean, that's two years of climbing and, and I did, what, maybe four or five free solos in the film, culminating with El Cap, which was obviously really important to me. But, but I did, you know, maybe six or seven days of free soloing mixed, you know, interspersed throughout two years of training. So, I mean, the ratio is pretty good. Uh, let's take one more question. Uh, and that will be uh, to... How about the really enthusiastic The really the enthusiastic yeah. person yeah. all the way in the back. Yeah. Yeah, she seems psyched. <laughs> All right, is, that, is that even a she? I can't tell. I, I won't go with sexes. <laughs> it's really hard to see. I apologize. <laughs> um, did you memorize yeah. <laughs> every single move, not just the biggest ones? And do you still memorize them? Uh, no, so I didn't memorize every move on the whole climb. Uh, mostly because I didn't have to. Like I was saying earlier, the El Cap maybe breaks down into a third relatively easy climbing, a third sort of moderate climbing, and a third really hard climbing. So the hard climbing, I knew every move, I knew everything about it. But for the easy climbing, I just knew that I could do it and just, you know, obviously I'd climbed it many times before, but I didn't have to memorize the moves. I could just trust that I could go up there and have a nice time and just climb. Uh, you know, so I basically I saved my effort for the parts that mattered the most. Um, let me just sort of take advantage and just ask you a final question. So uh, there have been a lot of like really young people um, asking you and you know you write about how you were a young kid with like not quite posters of Tommy on your wall but, but, close. but pretty close. So now you're that role model for I think a lot of really young climbers and what role do you want to model? I don't know, that's a hard question because I've definitely never aspire to be a role model of any kind. I would tell kids to stay in school, even though I unfortunately did not, but you know, but learn from my mistakes. Um, no, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I think that, I, I think the film does a good job of sort of showing that if you put enough work into something, I, I don't know. I mean, I guess if, if I want to be any kind of role model, I want it to be around living intentionally, choosing the things that you care about, working hard toward them and, and putting in the effort required, you know, working on the things you care about and doing them. Um, I mean, it was never, you know, that was never my, my design and, you know, I've, I certainly would never call myself a role model, but I'm sort of like, if you're going to pull anything from it, I mean, I hope it's something like that, you know, choose, I mean, we all have a finite life. I mean, we're all going to die. We have a limited amount of time. Use it for the things that you care the most about. Thanks. Alex Honnold. <laughs>